lips are distinct. The fingers are beginning to separate and hand movements can be seen. Bone formation, called ossification, begins within the clavicle or collarbone and the bones of the upper and lower jaw. That same yearning for freedom that nearly 250 years ago gave birth to a special place called America. It was a small cluster of colonies caught between a great ocean and a vast wilderness. It was home to an incredible people with a revolutionary idea that they could rule themselves that they could chart their own destiny. And then together, they could light up the entire world. Friends, Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to Praying for America. Very important dynamics to consider in these midterm elections. We have got to be really on the offense now uh, to gain ground, take nothing for granted. Uh, there are some polls that are tightening up, but I want to give you some perspective here about uh, some things we need to do. Uh, secondly, of course, I want to look at some of the insults that the uh, deluded uh, Democrats have been hurling at us uh, who are who are part of the MAGA movement, who are pro-life, who are sane, S-A-N-E, uh, unlike they are insane, and we who love America, unlike they who hate America. I want to give you some uh, response to some of those, uh, so th some of those insulting comments that the Brandon administration hurled at us recently, and I want to talk about uh, a few other uh, observations about what's going on at the current time. First, of course, we're going to go to the Word of God. We want to pray for your intentions, so uh, feel free to leave those in the comments as we go through our program. And this way here, as we pray for America, we all pray for one another as well. I want to go to Luke 16, starting with verse 19. The rich man and Lazarus. Let's read that parable of Jesus. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen, and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was a beggar named Lazarus, who was covered with sores. He longed to eat the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. From his place in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who may want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them that they may not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, 
they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Oh no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone should rise from the dead. Let us pray. Father, you have given us Moses and the prophets. Clear language, crystal clear admonitions, a way of life, a code of the covenant. You have given us Moses and the prophets. You have given us Jesus Christ, the gospels and the church. You have given us the witness of apostles, saints, and martyrs over 2,000 years of Christian history. You have given us our founding fathers who placed their trust in your providence and in your, nat- your law and in your, your role as supreme judge of the world. You have given us so much by which to guide our lives, make wise choices, and stay on the path of truth and salvation. Father, we have Moses, the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, the saints, Jesus Christ, the gospel, and the church. We have no excuse. We do not need someone coming back to us from the dead to tell us what we already have right in front of us in black and white. And yet we do have one who has risen from the dead, proving the truth of his teachings and conquering all evil. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he is among us, and he is in us, and he will come again. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the ruler of the people of the earth. Father, allow us to follow him faithfully. Give us the grace never to betray him as individuals, as families, as churches, and as a nation. We pray in the name of the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I wanted to read that passage of Lazarus and the rich man. You know, it wasn't because the man was rich that he went to hell. It was because he ignored the other man. And we, brothers and sisters, have a charge in this nation. And it is a charge fulfilled primarily through churches, families, and individuals, more than through government, that we have to care for the poor. We have had a president, Donald J. Trump, who did more to lift people out of poverty in America, to lower unemployment, to raise wages than anyone has done. He gave us the strongest and most robust economy in our history. How quickly some people forget. And that was was just from from the government. It's not even the government that has the primary role of doing all this. But President Trump, recognizing that, also did more than anyone else to empower, first of all, families to be generous and to help others because he raised up the power of family businesses, small businesses. How did he do that? He took away these burdensome government regulations And so if you let businesses flourish, if you let small families flourish in their business endeavors, you are facilitating the kind of generosity that the Gospels call us to. Furthermore, you want to foster that generosity among the people of God to help the poor and the needy what better to do than to foster the freedom of religion and the freedom of education? These two things go hand in hand. Because when you talk about school choice, the ability of parents to be able to send their children to the school they choose, and President Trump is constantly advocating that, as our Republican friends uh, all up and down uh, the ticket, 
What you are doing is you are enabling that family to better practice its religion because they're not sending their children to failing government schools, not only failing from the point of view of teaching the children reading, writing, and arithmetic, but failing in the moral values that are present or absent. You are enabling that family to practice its faith. You are enabling that family to pass along its faith. Because now they're able to use the help of a school which is actually going to be rowing in the same direction that the parents are in terms of what values they want to teach their children. What I'm pointing out here is to live the demands of the gospel, to live the demands of this parable, the best policies for government to take are those that not only in fact, to the limited extent that government should be doing this, lift people up out of poverty and destitution, but in fact empower families and businesses to be generous and families to live out their faith. See, if you have school choice, messages like this are going to be getting taught in the schools to which the parents choose to send the children. And they're going to be learning Moses and the prophets. And they're going to be learning Jesus and the Gospels and the church and the saints and the martyrs and the teachings about caring for the poor. I mean, this is so simple. And it's so true. And not only that, but empowering ministries to conduct their work. I know this firsthand as the leader of a national, in fact, international ministry, having lived under the Trump administration and led this ministry under the Trump administration, but also having lived under the Clinton administration as head of this ministry. That's when I started. It was under the Clinton administration and under the Obama administration. The difference is night and day. During those Democrat administrations, we felt burdened. We felt like we were not on an equal footing. And the reason we felt that way is because we were, in fact, that way. We weren't on an equal footing in terms of being able to both live out our faith and also enjoy the particular regulations of government and uh, the necessities of being law-abiding citizens. But if we ever wanted to uh, enter into contracts with the government or apply for government grants, we were made to feel like we had to deny our faith, do things contrary to the faith, be quiet about the faith. President Trump's administration explicitly, deliberately, and repeatedly reached out to ministry leaders like me and said, we don't want you to be quiet about your faith. We want you to proclaim your faith. They reached out to us. I sat in, in numerous conference calls. In fact, some of you watching now were were, were part of the administration and, 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 and helped conduct some of those calls. Whereby you told us, we never want you to feel like you have to compromise your faith or be quiet about it in order to interact in a fruitful way with the government, receive grants, enter into contracts, be law-abiding citizens. It was when Biden was in the office of vice president that he and Obama gave ministries like ours the mandate that we had to do things that went against our conscience. We had to include certain provisions in our health insurance plans for our employees that we objected to, things like abortion, certain kinds of abortion. And we said, absolutely not. We're not even going to think twice about that. They told us, oh, well, we'll give you a year to figure out how you're going to accommodate to this rule. We said, Go take a walk. We don't need a year. We don't need a day. We don't need a minute to, to consider whether we're going to accommodate that. Our answer is no. We will obey God rather than men. And we had to go through, together with many other groups, uh, a lengthy court battle went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And ultimately was the election of that man whose picture you see behind my shoulder that set us free from that mandate. So how do the poor of a country get served the best? How does the Lazarus of the 21st century best get served by the people who, understanding Moses and the prophets, know that they have to help the starving poor? Well, maybe it's when ministries committed to that gospel are able to function freely, proclaim their, the truth 
without reservation, and not only the functioning of these ministries, but the very core of our ministry as clergy to speak freely from the pulpit, the Word of God, as we understand it. What did President Trump do? He said to the clergy during his administration what these other, these other, these Democrat administrations, they end up saying just the opposite. They think religious freedom is discrimination. If we preach and teach God's plan for life and marriage and the family, they think we preaching God's plan for human life think it's the they they say it's the oppression of women and taking away their rights. They say it's extreme. These self-proclaimed see this is this is the adds insult to injury. These self-proclaimed Catholics, Biden and Pelosi, standing up in front of microphones after Roe v. Wade was reversed, and calling this extremism. An oppression of women, taking away women's rights. Meanwhile, the very position that they are criticizing as extreme and oppressive is the very position of the faith they claim to profess. It's the very position of the Catholic Church that the unborn should be protected. It's not just that it's the position of the Republican Party platform, which it also is. It's the position of the Catholic Church it's the position of the historic biblical Christian faith that life is sacred even from the time in the womb and that nobody has the authority to, to destroy it. What I'm saying is, President Trump said to us in the clergy, you speak your mind from the pulpit. You are not going to be censored by the government. You are not going to be silenced by the government. You are not going to be intimidated to shut up by the government. And yet, what does the, the branded administration do? And what does the Democrat Party do? That's exactly what they do. They intimidate. Oh, the hiring of the 87,000 IRS agents. You know that I had IRS agents way back in, oh, it was 2005, I guess, 2006, going through my sermons. Somebody over at the IRS learned an awful lot about abortion during those years because they asked us to send over box loads of sermons and TV programs and radio broadcasts. IRS agents, I wonder why they got a whole bunch more, these deluded Democrats who think that religious freedom is the same as discrimination, intolerance, extremism, and oppression. Be careful, brothers and sisters. This is where we have to go on the offense. Oh, by the way, let me just throw in a little, a little parenthesis here. That video footage that you see at the beginning of our programs uh, now that we are doing, the little baby that is uh, moving around in the womb, just at six weeks, we have footage of that baby before and after that time frame, but just at six weeks and seven weeks of development, amazing, isn't it? So many people who think, oh, this is just uh, an unformed mass of tissue, nonsense, highly developed baby. That came about from a doctor in Florida who, back in the 90s, published a little um, blurb in a medical journal that he had used what's called embryoscopy. It's a, it's a mechanism, not, it's a procedure not used frequently, whereby a camera is actually inserted up against the amniotic sac. And you see the baby in that kind of full living color that you saw on that video footage, you can go to erf.science. That's a website, erf.science, and see this uh, in, its, in, its, um, uh, in its most scientific context. Uh, you can look at our, at our website, lookatabortion.org, and we've got it there too. But this is the most stunning footage of the unborn child available. And it's not animation, and it's not uh, ultrasound even, where you've got the, the uh, relatively uh, grainy uh, sound wave generated images. Effective and astonishing as they are, because in that instance, the person is looking at the baby and saying, that's my baby in my womb. But here, if you want to talk just about how well you see the baby, 
and seeing the actual baby, this footage is unparalleled. So again, look at abortion.org. That's our website. And you'll be able to see not only that developing baby, but you'll be able to see what abortion does to that baby. And, and I want to tie these thoughts together. What I was just saying about uh, the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, and also on this issue, great is the difference between the two, right? One saying the Republicans, we have to re protect these babies. The others, the Democrats saying that uh, one can destroy them at will and without restriction. We've got to go on the offense. You know, some of the polls are showing a tightening between the Republicans and Democrats. There's absolutely, first of all, a lot of these polls are fake polls. We know, we, do we really have to remind you uh, about fake polls and how wrong polls uh, can be? Well, first of all, because a lot of them oversample Democrats. I mean, there you go right there. I mean, ask the polling company, but even some respected polling companies, you know, if they're showing a, a narrowing of the gap in this election, you know, that needs to that needs to energize us all the more to uh, and people are energized. We're energized by the, the Mar-a-Lago raid. We're energized in, in many ways. And I want to show you a little bit of polling here in a second. But we've got to go on the offense. That's my message here. And especially on things like this, when it comes to things like uh, abortion, my goodness, brothers and sisters, the American people have never wanted the extremism of abortion that the Democrats represent, expose it. Somebody's arguing with you about abortion and, oh, you know, those Republicans, they want to ban abortion. This is terrible. I, I can't vote for them. Oh, really? Well, do you, really, you want to vote for somebody who says you can abort a healthy baby of a healthy mother in the seventh month of pregnancy? Because that's exactly what the Democrats are proposing. They already, they, this is not speculation. They already voted. In the House of Representatives and in the Senate, they have their Women's Health Protection Act. You identify for me the limits on abortion that are in there. They want to take away the limits. They want to take away the regulations, even the, the ones that most Americans support. We got some polling that came out from uh, USA Today. Ipsos, showing um, six out of 10 in the Republican Party supporting President Trump for the nomination now. We know his support has been vigorous and strong. And this right up to the minute poll shows that continues to be the case. Among these Republicans, furthermore, 82% believe that President Trump will win the next presidential election. Of course he will. Brothers and sisters, who else is there for anyone who loves America and who wants to see things actually get done for the good of America, who else is there that is able to do this because of a proven track record that he already did? And, you know, that's what makes it so both insulting and absurd that the Brandon over there says that the semi-fascism, uh, this is the term he uses to describe the MAGA movement. I refer you to Dinesh D'Souza's book, Death of a Nation. You remember that book and the movie based on that book? Death of a Nation. Showing how the Democrat Party and its platform and its policies and its philosophy is what embodies the philosophy of the Nazi Party. Just continuing it into our day. I mean, start again with the basic question of life. What shows more fascism, or total government dominance over the human person, then the ideology that by government decree, you can just slaughter on a massive basis. You know how many children have been slaughtered in the womb without their choice, their choice, since the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973? The number is 65 and a half million. 
in America alone. Not to mention, Victor Davis Hanson does a, did, put out an article here I saw just uh, today. The strangest thing about semi-fascist Trump. And he asks a whole series of questions. I mean, how do you how do you identify a, 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 a how do you evaluate a, a, a comment like that? Well, ask some questions. Did Trump weaponize the IRS with eighty seven thousand new agents? Did he receive ten percent of quid pro quo payments as the big guy? Did he blatantly use national security apparatus to enhance his own reelection bid, as Obama did in that little? playing around with Putin uh, in, uh, in 2011 before his re-election campaign? Did Trump weaponize the FBI going after journalists, former Obama officials, or Democrat Party activists? Are there texts of Trump-era FBI agents talking about how to stop Clinton or Biden's election bid? Did Trump order a raid on Obama's home? where there were purportedly thousands of documents under dispute by the National Archives? Are there any former Trump loyalists who, as anonymous officials in cabinet agencies or obstructionists on the National Security Council, are writing about their stealthy daily efforts to undermine Biden's executive orders and administrative actions? Did Trump try to change voting laws in key states to radically transform traditional balloting? How about his efforts to revolutionize the very system of government by packing the Supreme Court? Did he do these things? Or did he instead make America more respected in the international arena, wiping out terrorists who were doing us harm, sending gang members out of our country, not letting them in by the thousands on the southern border, but getting them out, throwing them out, like they deserve to be thrown out so that they don't threaten and kill our families, friends, and communities. What did President Trump do? List the accomplishments side by side. You know, we have a, what we don't have here is enough time to go into all these things, but we have a party, party comparison, party platform comparison piece over there at ProLifeVote.com, our main election site. And it just quotes from the party platforms of the, of the two parties, which could not possibly be more opposed. But now... I'm updating it. I'm going to put out a second kind of a version, not quoting from the party platforms, but quoting from the real live experience of what we have lived under when you compare something like the Trump administration, greatest economy in our history, with the Brandon administration, the greatest inflation that we've had in four decades. When you compare the most secure southern border with no border at all, and on and on it goes. All the comparisons, you know them as well as I do. We're creating that as a handout that we're going to use in this election. It's time to go on the offense, brothers and sisters. Whether it's about baby killing or America killing or faith killing, it's time to go on the offense and paint these Democrats for what they are. And don't be silent and don't be afraid and don't be weak. And brothers and sisters, don't be deterred, whether by fake polls, real polls, or indifference or criticism. Let's pray. Father, we come before you because we love America and we we pray over all these things, Lord. Uh, first of all, the language that, that uh, is launched against those of us who love America and our patriots, uh, Lord, they, they are calling us things that represent exactly the opposite of what we strive for and what we do and what our team has accomplished for America. Lord God, free our nation and free our citizens from the blindness that so many are enveloped in when it comes to to this MAGA movement. Free them from the blindness 
starting right at the highest levels of our government, blindness to patriotism, blindness to actual accomplishments. We're not imagining these things. President Trump brought us all these things, and, and Lord, we have people who, how quickly they forget because they want to forget and they want us to forget. But Lord, your word tells us to remember. To remember, first of all, your deeds and your works, your mighty acts of deliverance, to remember the works of the Lord. Do this in remembrance of me. The Passover was a memorial service and meal And the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, is a memorial. Do this in remembrance of me. We are to remember, O God, your mighty works. And in that same spirit, we always remember the accomplishments of our great leaders. That's why the other side wants to erase our history. Lord, we're not going to let them. And that's why the other side wants to wipe out of people's minds the positive and enduring good that President Trump has done. Lord, we will not allow them to do that. We bring our prayers and praises together, Father, now by using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We pray for you, friends. God bless all your intentions. Thank you for leaving your prayer needs uh, there in the comments. We pray for all of you each day. And always remember, we belong to the greatest political movement in American history. And this country doesn't belong to the radicals who are trying to destroy it. This country belongs to you. As President Trump reminds us, we kneel not to government, but only to God and America's greatest days are yet to come. God bless you all. Father Frank Pavone here. Connect with me on social media at FR Frank Pavone, and we will talk to you soon.